They are one of the most prolific songwriting teams of the entire rock era, collaborating on more than 300 songs. I mean, from 1973 to 1976, this duo had a number one song an average of every four weeks. But uh, their addictions to alcohol, the substance, it forced a dissolution of their partnership and it impeded their respective careers for seven years. In fact, the 70s biggest superstar actually lost his passion for music altogether and he started to flounder in a big way. But the two would come back together and plan a comeback. But would it work? Find out the story and the song coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you believe the heart of rock and roll is still beaten, make sure that you subscribe below and uh, click the bell so you always get our daily features. Uh, also, check out our content at our page on Patreon to become an insider and get more there. Elton John and Bernie Taupin are one of the greatest songwriting duos of the rock era. That's a fact. Elton has sold over 300 million units with 31 platinum albums. Most of those 31 platinum albums are filled with the lyricism of Bernie Taupin, the self-proclaimed quintessential country bumpkin who idolized his sophisticated, figurative older brother that he met after the two answered uh, an advertisement, the same one posted in the magazine New Music Express, and that was back in 1967. Which, you know, that's how a lot of great partnerships started back then. Melody Maker, New Music Express, John and Toppin. They were on a Lennon and McCartney-like role from 1970 to 1976, for sure. It was an inseparable partnership that included collaboration on 15 top 10 pop singles, but after the release of the Blue Moves LP in 1976, Elton and Bernie needed a break from one another. Even the classic lineup of the Elton John band split up that very year and went their separate ways. Seven years later, with his career shockingly hitting the skids, Elton had had enough. While setting up the plan for his 17th studio album, the former Reginald Dwight put the Elton John band uh, back together again and connected with his amazing writing partner from the past, a Bernie, and they both got to work. And I guess that's why they call it the blue. What really came is the stuff of legend. So going back a few years, setting it up here, Elton John's drug abuse in the 70s has been well documented, but Bernie Toppin's overindulgence was just as out of control. After Blue Moves dropped, their respective excesses took their toll, and the two drifted apart from there. Bernie's marriage to Maxine Feibelman, his muse for Tiny Dancer, we've talked about before. On the close -up, tiny that ended, and he decided to check himself into a rehab center in L.A. to clean up his life. Instead of the powerhouse collaborations with Elton, Bernie went down a very different path, and he chose to work with the reinvention of Alice Cooper that happened in 1978. Bernie wrote lyrics for tracks recorded for Alice's LP from the inside, including the only hit from the album, How You Gonna See Me Now, that climbed to number 12 on the Billboard Hot 100. It's a big hit back then. Elton admitted that when he saw Bernie Taupin and Alice Cooper side by side for writing credits on From the Inside, he was extremely jealous. To add to Elton John's dismay, uh, Alice also employed the talents of his guitarist Davy Johnstone and bassist Dee Murray from the Elton John Band. Although Bernie and Alice had mutual respect for one another, the pairing it lacked the magic of a John Toppin collaboration. Uh, sometimes you go looking for magic with somebody else and it's just not there. It was also a strange period for the grandfather of shock. Perhaps the most bizarre, unimaginable moment was when Alice Cooper sang his love ballad, You and Me, on The Muppet Show, of all places. Meanwhile, Elton John, too, was floundering in unfamiliar territory. I mean, sales for his records declined, so did his passion for music. He even admitted to going through the motions during most days. When he was nominated for a Grammy Award in 1980 for Best Male Vocal for his performance on Mama Can't Buy You Love, 
Elton actually revealed that he laughed to his friends when he heard the news. He believed in reality it was one of uh, his worst, most uninspired performances. Baby, baby, I have to agree, not a big fan of that song. He may have started to, to take his global stardom for granted a little bit. I mean, the Billboard Top 10, it was real estate that Elton John outright owned in the 70s. How fast his fate would change, as we see in rock and roll. Following the number three single, Little Genie, with lyrics by Gary Osborne, uh, that one was released in May of 1980, Elton didn't have a single in the top 10 for three years. In fact, three consecutive singles failed to even make the Billboard Hot 100. Unthinkable in the 70s, or its peak. Although they weren't up to Elton's standards of achievement, there were some good tunes during the gap of underachievement. Uh, Nobody Wins from the LP The Fox, that stalled at number 21 in 81. Nobody wins when to fall. It's also Blue Eyes from Jump Up, that peaked at number 12. And of course, we have to acknowledge uh, Empty Garden, the emotional tribute to the slain John Lennon that Elton co-wrote with Bernie Taupin as the second single release from Jump Up in 1982. And when it came time to set the table for album number 17, Elton John and Bernie Taupin were determined to make a huge comeback. And so were the members of the Elton John band. The musicians that were so vital to the classic Elton John sound, I mean, J.B. Johnstone on lead guitar, Dee Murray on bass, Nigel Olsen on drums. The reunion album was actually titled Too Low for Zero, led by what I have to say is actually my all-time favorite Elton John tune. I guess that's why they call it the blues. And I guess that's why they call it. Bernie Taupin wrote, I guess that's why they call it the blues, as a love letter for his then-wife, Tony Russo. Uh, she's actually the sister of actress Renee Russo. Bernie wanted the world to know that the song was dedicated to his wife. So in the liner notes inside Too Low for Zero, he wrote, Hey, Tony, this one's for you. I guess that's why they call the blues is actually about a man that is unavoidably separated from the woman he pines for. So he feels what they call the blues. But through his forlorn longing, he remains hopeful, you know, that the distance between them is only temporary. And when it's all over, they'll have an exciting reunion. It's actually really a celebration, this song. Like children. Bernie Toppin's lyrics for I guess that's why they call it the blues resonate like one of those signs with an inspirational quote. There's persevering optimism found in the first verse with, don't look at it like it's forever. Between you and me, I could honestly say that things can only get better. The soul cleansing pre-chorus, and while I'm away, dust out the demons inside. <laughs> of course, the sultry, consummating chorus, Roll Like Thunder, Under the Covers. That actually got me in trouble with my grandma when I was singing it uh, one time. More on that one in a second. Like thunder, under the and of course, there's the resounding motivational passage that concludes verse two. This should be a daily mantra of how to embrace uh, life and love. Live every second without hesitation and never forget I'm your man. Hesitation, never forget I'm your man. I guess that's why they call it the blues. It's loaded with effusive devotion from Bernie, especially the stanza in the second pre-chorus. But more than ever, I simply love you more than I love life itself. More than I love life itself. It's a beautiful sentiment that Bernie actually regretted expressing. Years later, he stated that he would never write a lyric like that now uh, or ever again. Bernie called it a crass statement, actually. But let's not take away from Bernie's original intent, which was to let his love flow. I guess that's why they call it the blues. It recaptured Elton's uncanny ability to interpret Bernie's rather complex poetry. 
No one wrote like Bernie Taupin, and no one could make a song come to life like Elton John. Elton's vocal, and I guess that's why they call it the blues, is executed with spirited conviction. I mean, you could truly hear and feel the Rocket Man's reinvigorated passion for making music. Maybe that's why it's my favorite song by him. During that amazing string of smash hits in the 70s, Elton would often shift in and out of his wonderful falsetto. But on I guess that's why they call it the blues, he sang in a consistent lower register. The song was composed in the key of C major, which gave the track elements of sincerity and really warm empathy. The music, oh, I guess that's why they call it the blues, was composed by Elton, but actually with an assist from Davy Johnstone. In an interview, Davy shared that he was actually privileged to see Bernie's lyrics for I guess that's why they call it the blues before Elton John. Uh, Davy and Bernie were on a plane together, I guess. They were on their way to the recording sessions at Too Low for Zero, that album. And Davy grabbed Bernie's trusty lyric book, uh, the one that he always transcribed his ideas for songs. And he asked Bernie, if he could just take a peek, you know, just a little peek. At first, Bernie declined, stating that he never let anybody see his lyrics before Elton John. But Davey convinced him to make this one exception, just once. When Davey saw the lyrics to, I guess that's why they call it the blues, he said he knew the song was gonna be something extra special. One of the qualities that makes, I guess that's why they call it the blues, so ingenious is the musical arrangement. Uh, transformed a song about feeling the blues into a bright, uplifting celebration of life. Like children, like life. The track's arrangement has a, a bluesy sway about it, with a nod to the 50s, uh, courtesy of the heavy use of the seventh chords and the you know, harmonic doo-wop background vocals of Dee Murray and Nigel Olsen. Great touch there. Many forget, or maybe simply don't know, that Nigel Olsen had two top 40 solo hits in 1979 when he was on hiatus from the Elton John Band. There was this cover of A Little Bit of Soap that went to number 34 on the Billboard Hot 100 that happened in 1979. And then there was Dancing Shoes that peaked at number 18 in 79. As if the reunion of Elton Bernie and the Elton John band wasn't enough to make, I guess that's why they call it the blues, a slam dunk, they added that brilliant harmonica solo performed by the great, the genius, Stevie Wonder. That's really the secret weapon to this song. I mean, what an amazing masterstroke that was. Stevie was the perfect musician to lay down the harmonica because uh, of his vaunted playing style. I mean, rather than hammer through the arrangement with the thicker sound of the instrument's lower end, Stevie plays above it. Most harmonica players work within the limitations of the instrument, confining the sound to a restricted scale. But since he taught himself at the age of six, Stevie Wonder has always loved playing the chromatic harmonica, which has a stopper that shifts the pitch to an upper tone that allows the player to access a you know, full 12-note scale. I used to play a little harmonica myself, and uh, it's pretty difficult. Now, there are so many amazing Stevie Wonder harmonica solos. Songs like Shaka Khan, uh, Eurythmics, James Taylor, just to name a couple, as well as his own creations. <laughs> Stevie's harmonica solos are celebrated for their complexity and the use of jazz scales. His solo, and I guess that's why they call it the blues, it exuded a joyful nostalgia that tugs at the heartstrings. It's performed exclusively on single notes, and on the last part you can hear a great example of how to perfectly execute a rise to the high octave area of the harmonica to spice up a solo. Just when I thought I'd heard all about Stevie Wonder's genius, I was astounded to learn that Stevie's harmonica solo, and I guess that's why they call it the blues, was actually delivered during the practice session. I didn't know this until about a week ago. 
it was actually supposed to be just a run through. But the take was so exquisite, so creative. They told Stevie he'd given them perfection and it was used for the final recording. He was ready to go, no, I can do more. No, we got it. <music> Too Low for Zero actually returned Elton to platinum status. And I guess that's why they call it the blues, put him back in the top 10 on the singles chart with the song ascending all the way to number four on the Billboard Hot 100. It also went to number two on the adult contemporary chart in 83. It was a huge comeback for this songwriting duo. The track was a bona fide top five hit all around the world, including the UK and Canada and Australia and the Philippines. And it flew to number one in Zimbabwe as well uh, and other parts of Africa. Elton and Bernie's sweet comeback number, it's had some notable remakes. Mary J. Blige covered it along with uh, Alessia Cara. And I guess that's what it calls it, the blue. And James Blunt, to name a few. There's also a version with Luciano Pavarotti and Elton performing together during the Pavarotti and Friends for War Child Benefit concert. And I gotta mention, Elton John and Billy Joel played it together as a duet on many of their tours together. I always, it was just a highlight of the show. Billy nailed it on that song. The recording of Too Low for Zero, that album, was a special experience in the extraordinary career of Sir Elton John. Not only did the record mark the full return of his musical soulmate Bernie Taupin and the reassembly of the Elton John band, it was also how Elton met his first spouse, Renata Bluell. Uh, she was actually an engineer in the studio. Although the marriage to Renata only lasted years, uh, Elton's endearment for I guess that's why they call it the blues is eternal. He has called the song simply timeless. It's one of his favorites to sing, and he always sings the hell out of it. I mean, Elton's amazing. I remember loving this song as a kid. I recorded it off the radio, you know, until I saved up my allowance to buy the cassette. I remember one time, my parents, they went on a trip, and my brothers and sisters and I, uh, we stayed with my grandma and grandpa, and I asked my grandma if I could listen to my tapes on her little stereo while I did my homework. She said, of course you can, but keep it down while your grandpa's watching his boxing matches. I, my grandpa loved boxing. So I started listening to, I guess that's why they call it the blues. Uh, so really getting into how can you not? Like lovers, rolling like thunder. Before too long, I was singing it to the top of my lungs, laughing like children, living like lovers, rolling like thunder, you know, under the covers. And I guess that's what. And right when I get there to the word blues. I was interrupted by my grandmother with a rather stern reprimand. She actually unplugged the cord very dramatically and said, what in the heck is this obscene nonsense? This is not a song for little boys. I wasn't really a little boy at the time, though to be fair, grandma still thinks I'm a little boy, but she wasn't having it. It was actually really funny because Elton John was really tame compared to the other cassettes that I didn't dare play at their house that were a major part of my collection. So I gotta say, I do remember my grandma really liked Van Halen 1984. Um, I always had to fast forward through Drop Dead Legs though. Um, <laughs> that was one that I was not gonna, gonna play in front of her. <laughs> to end on though, uh, Bernie Toppin, the man who wrote this timeless classic, he still has a reverence for what they call the blues to give your life more meaning, more substance. Bernie encourages younger generations to read books, to stay off social media, and to discover the blues. I love that. And I guess that's why they call it the blues. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about this amazing song. Is it Elton's best? What are your memories of it? Do you have any funny stories about it? Uh, how do you feel about Elton's comeback and about Elton and Bernie as far as the greatest writing duos of all time, what's your top five Elton John song? Let's have a great discussion below and celebrate this, this amazing partnership. If you like our content, we do invite you to subscribe so that you can be a permanent part of, of this fixture here on rock and roll history. Until next time, three chords. 
and the truth.